Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here with Marco Learning and in this video I'm going to give you an overview of Unit 9 of the AP European History course which focuses on the Cold War and contemporary Europe. Essentially everything after World War II. So we're starting in 1945 where Europe has experienced the end of two massive wars that have shattered the continent. And so we begin with rebuilding Europe and who is that? It's the United States. Now, this isn't just a touch and go like with World War One that we are going to just come in for about a year. We're going to try to contribute as far as we can to a failed peace and then leave. This is the United States coming in, first of all, with the Marshall Plan. Now, the Marshall Plan was an economic aid package for Europe. And this is much different than what the United States did after World War One with the Dawes Plan, making loans and such. These were just grants of money. This created an economic miracle in Europe that Europe bounced back very quickly and the economies were going again. Now, of course, the Marshall Plan wasn't just the United States coming in out of the kindness of American hearts, but the Marshall Plan had the other motive to discourage European nations, especially in Western Europe, from embracing communism. So we see here the beginning of the Cold War, that the United Nations, uh, this organization that was created in order to provide a forum for all nations to get together. In spite of this, we start to see that Europe is divided between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Eastern Europe dominated by the Soviet Union and Western Europe in league with the United States. And this boundary between the two, Winston Churchill, Churchill said in a commencement speech in the United States, no less, that an iron curtain has formed. And so this Cold War, now why we call it a Cold War is because we don't see a continental war in Europe, but we do see massive buildup of American forces, especially in Germany, and a buildup of Soviet forces as well. So it's not a hot war, but there is this feeling that war could happen at any time. And while World War I was followed by disarmament, what we see here is an arms race, especially with the buildup of nuclear weapons. We see covert actions such as the American CIA and an age of propaganda on both sides. So Europe during this Cold War period is divided into these spheres controlled by these two superpowers. We have NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, where the United States is in league with Canada and Western Europe to protect from any kind of Soviet aggression. This is a mutual defense pact. NATO is an agreement between all of its members that an attack on one of us is considered an attack on us all. Now, the Soviets responded with the Warsaw Pact, which included not only the Soviet Union, but the Eastern Bloc countries. Now, by the Eastern Bloc, we mean countries such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, these nations that were not part of the Soviet Union per se, but they were dominated by the Soviet Union. This was the sphere of influence, this buffer zone that Stalin said would be necessary for Soviet security following these two wars with Germany. And within the Soviet Union, we also see changes. In the 1950s, Stalin died and was replaced by Nikita Khrushchev. Now, Khrushchev launched a program of de-Stalinization. In a secret speech uh, to the Communist Party, he denounced Stalin's cult of personality. Of course, he didn't say this in public because Stalin doesn't need to be criticized in public in a communist society. But this idea that the leader of the Soviet Union should not be this cult-like figure, and also we see that the gulags are eventually uh, dismantled. This system of terror is not the same as it used to be. Now, of course, they're still keeping an eye on people, but just not the same as during the Stalinist terror. 
And we see at this time during the 1950s and 1960s, occasional resistance in the Eastern Bloc as evidenced by the Hungarian Revolt and the Prague Spring. And the Prague Spring resulted in the Brezhnev Doctrine. Now, Brezhnev was another leader of the Soviet Union. After sending in Soviet forces to Czechoslovakia to put down this attempt at liberalization, Brezhnev announced that within the socialist sphere, any attempt to move away from socialism and toward capitalism was going to result in Soviet intervention because it is a problem that is shared by these communist countries. Now, this is synonymous kind of an answer to the Truman Doctrine, which was, of course, the doctrine that any Soviet expansion into a democratic country was going to be resisted by the United States and NATO. After World War II and even into our contemporary era, we see the endurance of nationalism and also in times where we see nationalism resulting in violence. When we think about some of these separatist movements, um, such as the IRA, the Catholics uh, in Northern Ireland, who are fighting against British control over an area that they believe should be theirs. We also see after the fall of the Soviet Union, Union, an uprising in Chechnya, which is a part of Russia that is predominantly Muslim, and they wanted to have their own country. This uprising was eventually put down. In the former Yugoslavia, uh, there are all of these ethnic groups. We have uh, Serbs, Bosnians, Croatians, people who are Catholic, Orthodox, Muslim, and they didn't get along in what we saw in the former Yugoslavia, the ethnic cleansing of Bosnian Muslims. So we still see these conflicts as people are constructing their national identities in the contemporary era. Following World War II, we see in most of the Western democracies the expansion and development of the welfare state. Now, elements of the welfare state, the, these ideas of cradle-to-grave policies, that things like health care and workers' insurance, these things should be provided by the government. This becomes standard in a lot of European countries. One example of this would be the British National Health Service, which was created by the labor government after World War II, that in Britain, healthcare is controlled by the state. And in other European countries, there's not necessarily direct state control of healthcare, but in places like the Netherlands, where everyone is required to buy health insurance and healthcare is generally seen as something that is a given, at least up to a certain point. To support these welfare states, Europeans have been willing to pay higher taxes than they pay paid before World War II and higher taxes than most Americans would be willing to pay today. One of the transitions that we need to note in contemporary Europe is the fall of communism. And what we see in the 1980s is the ascendancy of Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. He's got two reforms that we need to consider, glasnost and perestroika. Now, these are weird Russian words, but what I like to remember for glasnost, which means openness, I think in terms of glasnost, I can see through it. What Gorbachev is trying to do is to create a more open system of government. Even senior officials in the Communist Party, when Gorbachev took power, were not able to see the budget. Whereas in a place uh, like the United States or France, you can pull up the government's budget on the internet. Those things are public record. And Gorbachev believed that through glasnost, openness, and paradox, Perestroika, which was a restructuring of the system that he could save communism by introducing elements of liberalism. He wasn't trying to liberalize for the sake of liberalizing, but to try to save the communist system. Now, perestroika, restructuring, remember, stroika structure, creating a government that is more open and it's restructuring. And he's allowing criticism of the government, open criticism, believing that it was going to make the government stronger and more responsive. Now, instead, once Gorbachev opened the floodgates of criticism, it just poured out like rain and 
the government eventually failed and we see the collapse of communism as a result of Gorbachev's attempt to save it. Now, also, we want to note that Gorbachev renounced the Brezhnev doctrine, this doctrine that the Soviet Union was going to intervene in the Eastern Bloc um, in order to preserve its own dominance in that area. And in 1989, as a result of this, we see the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany no longer East and West Germany as they had been during the Cold War. And then by 1991, even the Soviet Union has collapsed. So in 1991, we see the fall of communism. The post-war era also gives us a new wave of feminism, what we would refer to as second wave feminism. Now, first wave feminism was about suffrage. It was about political rights. It was about the right to vote. But what we saw in the period after World War I is that while women were able to vote, women's places in society remained largely unchanged. Women's positions economically largely remained unchanged as they still found themselves excluded from the professions. Women in academia, law, and medicine, still very rare after World War II. And Simone de Beauvoir is somebody that is important to note here. She was the author of a book called The Second Sex, where she went through this whole idea that women have been seen in Western history and Western society as other, that really the man is seen as the default, the woman has been seen as other, and she is advocating for a redefinition of what it means to be woman. And so we see new models of the family and we see that divorce and birth control become more prevalent. Before World War II, divorce was rare, generally frowned upon, which in Western society today, divorce is just something that tends to happen. Birth control, of course, gave women control over when to have a family, which is allowing women to participate in the workplace on their own terms. And not only are women participating in the workplace in post-war Europe, but we also see female political leaders, such as Margaret Thatcher, who was elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in 1979. Now, one of the ironies of this is that Margaret Thatcher, even though she was the first first uh, elected head of government in modern European history, she was in many ways a conservative influence. And Thatcherism is a collection of ideas uh, when we think about social conservatism, uh, traditional values, uh, Euroscepticism, and also anti-union. We see elements of what we would refer to as neoliberalism, that even though we see after World War II that the European state apparatus became more involved in the economy with the neoliberal approach, we start to see that some of these industries that had been controlled by the state are moving back into private hands. So when you think about uh, economic liberalism, social conservatism, Euroscepticism, and Thatcher's standing up to the unions after the winter of discontent in the late 70s, then that collection of ideas is known as Thatcherism. The end of World War II also caused Europeans to rethink their place in the world and also for colonized peoples to think about their own place in the world and their own self-determination. After World War I, Woodrow Wilson promoted national self-determination within Europe, whether it was the Poles or the Romanians or the Czechs and the Slovaks who might need to share a country for a while, but deserve the right to self-determination. Now, after World War I, there's no discussion of what about the Algerians? What about the Vietnamese? What about India? Now we see these conversations happening, and sometimes it's more than a conversation. A decolonization begins to happen after World War II, and this is the second phase of decolonization, not like the first where the British and the French just kind of took over these mandates, but where they they are actually liberating these countries and giving them the same self-determination that Europeans enjoyed after World War I. Now, we see this happening in India through peaceful means, but in other places such as Indochina, Vietnam, this is something that is 
resisted by the French. Of course, the French had their own issues after World War II and wanted to try to preserve um, some element of their martial identity, but then that ended up failing in both Algeria and Indochina. Within Europe, we see Europeans grappling with these ideas of European and national identity in the post-war era. In the early 90s, we see the formation of the European Union, which is not only about a shared economy, a shared currency, the euro, but also the free movement of peoples throughout the European Union, and also the formation of a European Parliament that has the ability to make laws that apply to all members of the European Union. Now, of course, as we've seen, European integration, this idea of Europe becoming one integrated whole, there have, of course, been challenges to this. As we see enduring nationalism in Europe, we still see a people speaking different languages Languages. When we go from one European nation to another, we see very different cultures. And so we've seen a rise in what we would call Euroscepticism, which this is the idea that there should be more national self-determination and a greater emphasis on national sovereignty and identity. We can see those things today with Brexit or with the National Front in France, which of course is mainstreaming itself and is now now called, I believe, the National Rally. So we see that these ideas of Euroscepticism, which used to be seen as fringe, are now becoming more mainstream. And this is where we don't really know where Europe is going. Will Europe become more integrated or will the European Union be something that falls apart or has less of an influence going forward? Time will tell. One of the biggest challenges facing modern Europe in the post-war era and continuing today are challenges of migration and immigration. That Europe has experienced uh, lots of new migrants from Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And of course, this creates the question, to what extent are these people European? To what extent should they be integrated into the nation? To what extent should they maintain the identities from their countries of origin? So we see today that European governments are trying to figure out how to handle this current migration crisis. As far as philosophy, World War II, similar to World War I, caused a lot of people to question rationality and the crisis of human existence. Now, what we see coming about in the post-war era, existentialism has been around, but it is going to become more popularized in the hands of thinkers such as Jean-Paul Sartre, who said that there is no objective reality, that the whole idea of existentialism is built on this idea of subjectivity, and you then have the responsibility to create your own life and live it according to your own values. Existentialist philosophy is much less about the pursuit of some objective truth that's out there, but more on the construction of a truth that is going to work for you as you live in this unpredictable modern age. Now, that is not to say that Europe has gone full on existentialist. While there are a lot of people who have embraced existentialism and are no longer religious or they're marginally religious, we see the continuity of Christianity. And of course, that is going to be uh, to a different extent in different European countries. So you look at places like Italy and Ireland, where to be Italian or to be Irish, that it is to be Catholic or somewhere like Greece, where to be Greek is to be Orthodox. But then you look at places like France and the Czech Republic, where there are a lot of irreligious people, even though France still has a very strong Catholic culture. And speaking of the Catholic Church, we see a number of reforms in the Catholic Church in Vatican II. For example, the Mass is no longer said by a priest in Latin 
Latin who is facing away from the congregation, but a priest who is speaking in the vernacular, looking toward the congregation. So Vatican II is the other important church council that you need to make sure you know in addition to the Council of Trent during the Counter-Reformation. Now, even though the Catholic Church has made some reforms, we want to note that there have been some continuities as well. The Catholic Church still condemns the use of birth control, still has an all-male priesthood, and still mandates clerical celibacy from these male priests. So Unit 9 covers virtually everything after World War II. So the first thing we want to note is the Cold War, the entrance of the United States through the Marshall Plan, and NATO, the United States becoming the superpower that exercises continuing influence in Europe, opposed by the Warsaw Pact made up of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War. We see an expansion of government and the welfare state as in most places places in Europe, healthcare becomes a given. We see that a lot of industries are turned over to the government during the post-war period. We see feminist philosophy and existentialist philosophy um, that are advancing in this post-war era. And then the fall of communism between 1989 and 1991. And since the fall of communism, we see an increasingly globalized and integrated Europe, but let's not forget that nationalism continues to be a very vibrant force in European culture and politics. And with that, we have finished our overview of the entire AP European History course. Thank you very much for watching. It is always a pleasure.